You have to promise not to hate me for this joke. Because it's pretty bad. How many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? Tentacles. Boom! <gasps> Catboy, you need to get out of here. Look, Catboy is pretty cool, but he is not as cool as Buck, the ultimate dog man. So we're going to read more about Buck today, uh, more in Chapter 2, and we're going to see what happens with this guy. I'm excited. Let's take a look. Last time uh, we had a lesson, we began reading and discussing Chapter 2 of Call of the Wild. Uh, and we were analyzing incidents from the chapter and what they revealed about Buck, Francois, and Perot. Some really interesting things we pulled from that lesson. And we start to see Buck developing um, out of his comfort zone. Okay, He's been shocked. I mean, really shocked at some things that happened. And we also get to see that uh, Francois and Perot are fair men, but they're also very uh, difficult men. Uh, a different kind of person than Buck has ever been around before. We'll see what happens with the rest of this chapter. Today what we're going to do, we're going to finish reading and discussing chapter 2 of Call of the Wild. We are going to analyze Buck's decisions and see what they reveal about his transformation in the wild. So we do see him transform a lot more. And I do have something new for you guys today. Uh, we're going to have some bonus. Yes! So. Inside of this video, I have hidden a uh, bonus task, okay? And it's uh, some little bonus task I'm going to ask you to do. This is for the people who are watching the video. Now, I do have a couple people who want to be cool, like too cool to watch the videos, and they've decided they want to work on their workbooks without ever watching the video. And I'm, I'm on to them. I'm on to them. So I want to reward you for watching the video all the way through. So watch for this uh, golden ticket here. Uh, somewhere in this video, you're going to see the golden ticket with some instructions on it. You do those instructions and you'll have a little bonus. All right, so hang in there. What you're going to need today is Call of the Wild by Jack London. Uh, our book, lovely little book, and the incident chart, uh, just to refer back to. We're not filling out on the incident chart, which is on page 31. We filled it out last time which is if you just need to go back to it and revisit some of the events, that's always good to do. Finally, you will need the split page notes for chapter two. This is a series of notes that you can use um, for studying. It's great for studying. And uh, that's in blue notebook pages 28 to 30. Go ahead and have all those things ready. All right, the very first thing we're gonna do is read through the rest of chapter two two okay so go ahead and get your books ready uh it starts on page 19 with uh tree more huskies this should say three i made a mistake here you see how it says tree this should say three more huskies three spelling error so three more huskies on page 19 get there pause the video until you get there and then i'll meet you back here all right you're there on page 19 let me erase the mess i made there we go Page 19, and do forgive me, I do still have a little bit of a cough here. Try not to cough in your ear. Okay. So what had just happened is uh, Buck was shocked uh, about uh, the death of a fellow dog. And um, Francois uh, figures out that Buck is really a great dog after all, <clears throat> after he pulls for a little while. So let's pick it up there on page 19 near the bottom. Three more Huskies were added to the main team inside an hour, making a total of nine. And before another quarter of an hour had passed, they were in harness and swinging up the trail toward the Dai Canyon. Buck was glad to be gone, and though the work was hard, he found he did not particularly despise it. He was surprised at the eagerness which animated the whole team and which was communicated to him. But still more surprisingly was the change wrought in Dave and Solex. They were new dogs, utterly transformed by the harness. 
All passiveness and unconcern had dropped from them. They were alert and active, anxious that the work should go well and fiercely irritable with whatever by delay or confusion retarded that work. Retarded means delayed, okay? <clears throat> the toil of the traces seemed the supreme expression of their being and all that they lived for and the only thing in which they took delight. Dave was a wheeler or a sled dog. Pulling in front of him was Buck. Then came Solex. The rest of the team was strung out ahead, single file to the leader, which position was filled by Spitz. Buck had been previously placed between Dave and Solex so that he might receive instruction. Apt scholar that he was, they were equally apt teachers, never allowing him to linger long in error and enforcing their teaching with their sharp teeth. Dave was fair and very wise. He never nipped Buck without cause, and he never failed to nip him when he stood in need of it. As Francois's whip backed him up, Buck found it to be cheaper to mend his ways than to retaliate. It means it was easier for him to fix what he was doing wrong than to fight against it. Once, during a brief halt, when he got tangled in the traces and delayed the start, both Dave and Solix flew at him <clears throat> and admon administered a sound trouncing. The resulting tangle was even worse. But Buck took great care to keep the traces clear thereafter. And ere the day was done, so well had he mastered his work, his mates about ceased nagging him. Francois's whips snapped less frequently, and Perrault even honored Buck by lifting up his feet and carefully examining them. It was a hard day's run up the canyon, through sheep camp, past the scales and the timber line, across glaciers and snow drifts hundreds of feet deep, and over the great Shilcook Divide which stands between the salt water and the fresh and guards forbiddingly the sad and lonely north. They made good time down the chain of lakes, which fills the craters of extinct volcanoes, and late that night pulled into the huge camp at the head of Lake Bennett, where thousands of gold seekers were building up boats against the breakup of the ice in the spring. Buck made his hole in the snow and slept the sleep of the exhausted just, but all too early was routed out in the cold darkness and harnessed with his mates to the sled. That day they made 40 miles, the trail being packed, but the next day, and for many days to follow, they broke their own trail, worked harder, and made poorer time. <clears throat> As a rule, Perrault traveled ahead of the team, packing the snow with webbed shoes to make it easier for them. Francois, guiding the sled at the gee pole, sometimes exchanged places with him, but not often. Perrault was in a hurry, and he prided himself on his knowledge of ice, which knowledge was indispensable, for the fall ice was very thin, and where there was swift water, there was no ice at all. Day after day, for days unending, Buck toiled in the traces. Always they broke camp in the dark, and the first gray of dawn found them hitting the trail with fresh miles reeled off behind them. And always they pitched camp after dark, eating their bit of fish and crawling to sleep into the snow. Buck was ravenous, that means incredibly ridiculously hungry. Buck was ravenous. The pound and a half of sun-dried salmon, which was his ration for each day, seemed to go nowhere. He never had enough, and suffered from perpetual hunger pangs. Yet the other dogs, because they weighed less and were born to the life, received a pound only of the fish and managed to keep in good condition. 
he swiftly lost the fastidiousness or pickiness of which his let me start that line over again he swiftly lost the fastidiousness which had characterized his old life a dainty eater he found that his mates finishing first robbed him of his unfinished ration there was no defending it while he was fighting off two or three it was disappearing down the throats of the others to remedy this he ate as fast as they and so greatly did hunger compel him he was not above taking what did not belong to him he watched and learned when he saw pike one of the new dogs a clever malingerer and thief slyly steal a slice of bacon when perot's back was turned he duplicated the performance the following day getting away with a whole chunk a great uproar was raised but he was unsuspected while dub an awkward blunderer who was always getting caught was punished for buck's misdeed the first theft marked buck as fit to survive in the hostile northland environment it marked his adaptability his capacity to adjust himself to changing conditions the lack of which would have meant swift and terrible death it marked further the decay or going to pieces of his moral nature a vain thing and a handicap in the ruthless struggle for existence let's push pause for a second i want to explain what's going on here at the beginning of this paragraph it says that this uh the theft marked his fitness to live in the hostile northland there's this thing uh, in evolution again i'm not teaching you to believe or not believe in evolution but as a theory this is what they say is that um darwin said that the fit survive right fit means you're able to do something so those who are able to survive will survive and those who aren't able to survive will die pretty easy logic right and so the idea of being in the wild it's like if you can't eat fast you don't get enough food you die so the slow eating dogs were the ones that were dying off dogs that were selfish and fierce and mean they would get all the food therefore they would survive so the only dogs you have left in the northland are what right mean hostile aggressive dogs so this line about buck being fit him, him thieving and it's showing that he's fit it's it's all about uh he's he's becoming an animal of that land and then it says also that it marked further the decay or going to pieces of his moral nature so morality the idea of like right and wrong his ideas of right and wrong are falling apart okay this is where we can see jack london maybe is a little bit of a nature faker because honestly dogs don't seem to worry too much about morals like what's right and wrong look a dog is going to sniff its butt like it's not worried about right and wrong and here we see buck is he's, he's aware of like oh i shouldn't be thieving things but now he realizes i don't care that's the only way I'm going to eat. I'm going to thieve as much as I can. So this environment is doing some very different things to him. Let's pick it up again about in the middle of the paragraph where it says it was all well enough. Pause if you need to get there in the middle of that paragraph in the center of the page. It was all well enough in the Southland under the law of love and fellowship to respect private property and personal feelings. But in the Northland, under the law of club and fang whoso took such things into account was a fool and in so far as he observed them he would fail to prosper right so those dogs who respect personal property and respect people's feelings those dogs are foolish in the northland next paragraph not that buck reasoned it out he was fit that was all and unconsciously he accommodated himself to the new mode of life all his days no matter what the odds he had never run from a fight but the club of the man in the red sweater had beaten into him a more fundamental and primitive code 
civilized. He could have died for a moral consideration, say, the defense of the Judge Miller's riding whip. But the completeness of his de-civilization was now evidenced by his ability to flee from the defense of a moral consideration and so save his hide. Right, so he's saying it's evident that he's changing because he doesn't care about the moral considerations. He's like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get what I need to survive. So it's showing that he's changing. That's what that, that sentence means. Last sentence on the page. He did not steal for the joy of it, but because the clamor of his stomach. He did not rob openly, but stole secretly and cunningly out of respect for club and fang. In short, the things he did were done because it was easier to do them than not to do them. His development, or retrogression, was rapid. This word retrogression, retro means behind, okay? And we think of progress, means going forward, pro meaning good, so forward, good, things progressing. Retrogression, he's saying moving backwards or moving negatively backwards. So they say his development or his backward moving, depending on how you look on it, was rapid. His muscles became hard as iron, and he grew callous to all ordinary pain. He achieved an internal as well as an external economy. He could eat anything, no matter how loathsome or indigestible, and once eaten, the juices of his stomach extracted the last, least particle of nutrient, and his blood carried it to the farthest reaches of his body, building it into the toughest and stoutest of tissues. Sight and scent became remarkably keen, while his hearing developed such acuteness that in his sleep he heard the faintest sound and knew whether it heralded peace or peril. He learned to bite the ice out with his teeth when it collected between his toes. And when he was thirsty and there was a thick scum of ice over the hole, the water hole, he would break it by rearing and striking it with stiff forelegs. His most conspicuous trait was an ability to scent the wind and forecast it a night in advance. No matter how breathless the air, when he dug his nest by tree or bank, the wind that later blew inevitably found him to leeward, sheltering and snug. So this is saying that he, he was able to predict where the wind would be the next night, and he would dig his hole so that the wind would blow over him instead of blowing down into the hole. He would build it so it would kind of, the wind would jump over. So he's getting in touch with nature. Next paragraph. And not only did he learn by experience, but instincts long dead became alive again. The domesticated generations fell from him. In vague ways, he remembered back to the youth of the breed, to the time the wild dogs ranged in packs through the primeval forest and killed their meat as they ran it down. Push pause, that word primeval, primeval forest, that's another word. It's like we looked at the word primordial. <clears throat> We've also looked at the word primitive. And it's that same prefix prim, meaning primary or first things. So continuing with, it was no task. It was no task for him to learn to fight with cut and slash and the quick wolf snap. In this manner, had fought forgotten ancestors. They quickened the old life within him and the old tricks which they had stamped into the heredity of the breed were his tricks. They came to him without effort or discovery, as though they had been his always. And when, on the still cold nights, he pointed his nose at a star and howled long and wolf-like, it was his ancestors, dead and dust, 
pointing nose at star and howling down through the centuries and through him. And his cadences were their cadences, the cadences which voiced their woe, and what to them was the meaning of the stillness and the cold and dark. Thus, as a token of what a puppet thing life is, the ancient song surged through him, and he came into his own again. And he came because men had found a yellow metal in the north, and because Manuel was a gardener's helper whose wages did not lap over the needs of his wife and the diverse small copies of himself. Well done. All right, great job getting through that. Let's look at one of these particularly interesting passages of change, because uh, again, we're looking at Buck's character and how he changes. Let's look at this passage together. It's on the bottom of page 21. It's the last paragraph on page 21. Pause it to get there. Okay, it's also up here on the uh, slide. And uh, <clears throat> let's read through it and let's think about the way Buck has changed. How does this show Buck changing? Let's read it together. He swiftly lost the fastidiousness which had characterized his old life. Again, fastidiousness means pickiness. A dainty eater, he found that his mates finishing first robbed him of his unfinished ration. There was no defending it. While he was fighting off two or three, it was disappearing down the throats of the others. To remedy this, he ate as fast as they. And so greatly did hunger compel him. He was not above taking what did not belong to him. He watched and learned. When he saw Pike, one of the new dogs, a clever malingerer and thief, slyly steal a slice of bacon when Perot's back was turned, he duplicated the performance the following day, getting away with the whole chunk. A great uproar was raised, but he was unsuspected. While Dub, an awkward blunderer who was always getting caught, was punished for Buck's misdeed. Let's look at this word right here. This is a great word. Dainty. A dainty eater. Man, I'm not going to make you look up the word dainty, but you should. You really should look up dainty. When <laughs> Bucket here is described as a dainty eater. It's pretty funny. Dainty is kind of this word like, like I have, you know, you guys know I have four daughters. When they drink out of little teacups, little Barbie teacups, I mean, they're like this big. They're the tiniest teacups in the world. And they drink them in such a dainty way. They put their little fingers in it. It's like, wow. So Buck is described as a dainty eater. And fastidiousness, pickiness, and conscientiousness. He's really caring about every little thing he eats. And he'll pick out this kid. I don't know if you've seen dogs do this, where they pick out one kind of the dog food out of the other. Um, so he goes from that. This is one way he is. To now... He's eating incredibly fast. He's stealing. He's now he's described as sly, okay, um, and or he well he's he's seeing how Pike got it done slyly, but he does the whole thing. I mean he he does this. He he becomes sly. He starts uh, letting other dogs take credit for the thieving. So he's really changed. We've seen how much he's changed already with this passage. So we're going to go to our split page notes on the next slide, and this is where we're really going to analyze some of these changes. Okay, you should go ahead and uh, turn in your split page notes uh, to in your blue notebook to page 28 and 29. We're going to work on that right now. And in Call of the Wild, page 21, he swiftly lost. We're going to cover the last, this is really about the last six paragraphs. So what you should do is on your own, on your own, and I do mean this, reread paragraph, the last six paragraphs starting right there on page 21 where it says he swiftly lost. Go ahead and read through to the end of the chapter <clears throat> and read through it. You can look through your uh, notes here, split page notes, look through those questions, those three questions there, and then reread. Um, try not to stop until you reread it all. And uh, so reread them. And then uh, you can discuss with your partner or anybody around you kind of your answers to the questions. 
And I would like you to answer on your split page notes, answer all these questions. Okay, question one, two, and three. Answer them and do use complete sentences and any evidence you find as well. Okay, don't cheap out on the evidence. We want to provide at least one quote for every one of our answers. You don't have to write ace, ice, ick paragraph here, not ace, ice, ick. Um, and again, do use complete sentences. And here's the bonus. I'm not going to leave it up very long, but your bonus, if you need to rewind and look at it, you can. Use the word metamorphosed correctly in any one of your answers for plus five points on any assignment. So if you're missing five points somewhere, you're going to use the word metamorphosed somewhere in here, and I want you to circle it. So wherever you use the word metamorphosed, you're going to circle it on your page. And when I come by, I'm going to check for it, okay? And I don't want you to tell anyone else, okay? It's our little secret about this little bonus, okay? So uh, this is for you because you watched the video all the way through. So again, work with the word metamorphosed. If you're not sure what it means, go back to your vocabulary list, all right? I gave you too much instructions. Maybe you can rewind if you need to. Um, finish this, then move on to the next slide. All right, so you have finished the questions on page 28. And uh, yes, 29 a little bit. There's just a little bit there. And right now what we're going to do is look at page 29 and 30. And answering this question, it says, in chapter two, Buck has both developed and regressed, like progress moves forward, regression moves backwards. So it says he's regressed. He's gone backwards in some ways um, as he joins the law of club and fang. Identify one decision that Buck makes in chapter two and explain how it reveals both his development and his regression. Ace ice ick yes you know it this is an ace ice ick ace ice and it's the worst what ice e ick oh my lord of dogs it's ugly but you know i'm trying to write with my fingertip here all right this is going to be an ace ice ick paragraph you need two pieces of evidence that's right two and if you're smart about it it says identify one decision okay so this is a really good um, assertion, right? You can clearly answer this by listing one thing and two pieces of evidence. Hmm, how it reveals both development, so a positive move for him, and regression, a move toward the past or something he's lost. So something he's gained, something he's lost. So an evidence for this one be a good idea, right? An evidence for this one and an evidence for this one. That's two pieces of evidence. Easy. Ace Isaac paragraph. Get to it. All right. You are done with that Ace Isaac paragraph. Uh, in this lesson, you finished reading and discussing chapter two of Call of the Wild. You analyzed decisions that Buck made and uh, what they revealed about his character and transformation in the wild. You guys did awesome. Say goodbye to Catboy.